Welcome to the NC Choices webinar series, Teaching Tools for Beginning Farmers, funded by the United States Department of Agriculture's Beginning Farmer and Rancher Development Program. I am Margaret Ross, Eastern Area Specialized Poultry Agent with NC State Extension, and I'm going to present the module on Poultry Health and Animal Welfare. This is one of five modules offered in this webinar series. This presentation is on pasture poultry health and animal welfare. So I wanted to start with a slide of what an actually a healthy bird looks like. So you see a couple of examples here. The birds are standing up and upright. They're walking around well. They're not laying down. They don't have any discharge from any of their, their nose or their eyes. Their combs and their wattles are clean and they look good. Their feet and their legs look good and they just look completely healthy and normal. So this is a good basis for starting with the health and animal welfare presentation to see what a healthy bird looks like. Disease recognition. So due to economics, the diagnosis of poultry diseases is often made using a combination of the history of the bird and the flock, the symptoms that are occurring at that time, and a response to treatment as opposed to going to the lab. And that is just because we spend a very minimal amount of, of dollars per bird to start our flocks in our backyard, maybe two or three dollars or even five dollars per bird. And so being able to take them to the lab may be, be, may be a little bit more expensive. However, you'll see later in the presentation that that can still be a really good idea to spend the money and send the bird to the lab if you're having chronic problems in your flock. So therefore, learning that the clinical signs of disease and routine observation of the birds is really important to figure out if you have a problem in your flock, what's going on. Reservoirs of disease. So disease-causing organisms are generally found in live birds, in the secretions of live birds, and in freshly dead birds. Rodents and insects can also be reservoirs. They are nasty little critters that can house all sorts of diseases and so it's really important in your flock to make sure that you have a good rodent control program in place. Most diseases are actually spread by humans. We are the biggest vector out there uh, that spreads disease and so we have disease on our boots or our clothes and then we take that from one flock to the next by accident. Avoid sick birds, secretions from birds, and also don't forget to properly manage your poultry mortality to prevent infecting your healthy birds. A carrier bird is a bird that has recovered from a disease but can still actually shed that organism. So it's really important to quarantine those birds to help identify them. So an example would be a bird that has recovered from salmonella and then is able to still shed that organism with their friends and the rest of the flock and able to infect the other birds. Other concerns would include nutritional concerns. If they've gotten into some type of chemical toxin that you maybe didn't know about in your backyard or other toxins. Also some type of traumatic injury or excessive stress or predators. Don't forget that if you have a bird that has been affected in some way by something, whether it's a predator, maybe got to them a little bit but didn't quite kill them, and now they have some type of area where they have a gash or something like that, all of the rest of the flock are going to gang up on that bird, especially if they see blood or the color red. So it's important to realize that you do have to pay attention to your birds every day to make sure that you don't notice any problems that could actually affect the entire flock's health. The biggest thing that I tell all of my clients here at NC State Extension is to look at your birds. Go out, be with them, spend a few minutes with them every day, you have to go out there and collect the eggs every day, make sure that they have feed, and make sure that they have water anyway. So just take a few extra minutes and actually look at your flock. Do they have good posture? You can see the birds in these pictures do not have the posture of the birds that I showed you in the first slide. They were standing up, they were happy, they were healthy. These birds are slumped over, they seem uncomfortable, they probably are not eating at that time, and their activity level is very low. So that leads us into food and water consumption. Make sure that all of your flock are actually eating and drinking and that you don't see anyone shying away from the feeder and the waterer. 
Activity level is very important. Now, obviously during some times of the year, depending upon heat or cold, there may be a little bit lowered activity levels in your flock, which is perfectly normal. But if you see the pictures and the postures that are you're seeing on this slide, know that the activity levels of those birds are decreased and there's probably an underlying issue. Also egg production. If you see that you have a flock of five or 10 birds and you're only getting one egg a day and they're at the time in their life where they should be laying every day or almost every day, then you know that there's something going on with your flock. So what do you actually look for? And there's three different ways that you can find out a little more specifically if something is going on with your flock. One is respiratory disease. So what you would look for for that would be fluid from the eyes or the nares, which is their nose. Are they shaking their head or wiping their face on their feathers or over their wings? Open mouth breathing, or if they have a pale to a blue color. For GI or gastrointestinal disease, then you would look for loose feces or diarrhea, discolored droppings that they're not eating, or dirty feathers around the vent. We see a lot of dirty vents when we go out to farm visits, and so that could be a, a way to see that you have an underlying gastrointestinal issue in your flock, but sometimes it could just be that the birds don't clean themselves very well too. And lastly, the nervous, sense, nervous system disease is things that are neurological, obviously. So they're unable to stand, they have a head tilt, they're walking unsteady, or they're unable to right themselves. So they can't quite stand up as though they should be able to. So I really like this chart that I was able to gather from Richard Goforth, who is another poultry agent in the state. And how he set this up was on the left-hand side, you can see what you're going to be looking at as far as the anatomy of the bird goes. And then on the right-hand side of the slide, you could see what potential problems could arise. So for the combs and the wattles, are they swollen or discolored for the eyes? Do they have any type of cloudy aspects to them or any type of drainage? For the nasal passages, are they discolor or do they have any discoloration or discharge? Are the wings drooping? And then for the feet and the legs, do they have the right color for the age of the bird? Do they have any type of scales or do they have any type of actual physical injuries? On the left-hand side of the, the slide, you can see the picture of the bird that is obviously laying down, but you can see that on, the, on that picture, you can see that the eyes are somewhat swollen and that the bird probably has a tough time opening his eyes or her eyes. On the right-hand side, you can see that the, there's, nasal, there's discharge from the nasal passages, that there's frothy and crusty eyes as like the layer on the left, and that you have some type of wing drooping, which indicates that you may have some type of problem. Here's another slide that's set up in a similar way. The walk or the gait, is it slow or difficult, or are they moving around as though there is no problem? Their appetite, are they eating normally? Are they drinking normally, which would be thirst, of course? The movement, do they have a normal activity level, or are they just laying around and are lethargic and not wanting to go and eat and drink? Do they have any type of coughing or sneezing? And specifically, do they have any type of snickering or rattling to that cough or that sneeze? As far as their breathing goes, are they panning or gasping, which would obviously indicate a larger problem? And then also for disease symptoms, as far as the feces go, is there any type of change in color, frequency, or consistency? And is there a presence of blood or mucus? So it's important to pay attention to not only the behavioral symptoms that could be going on disease-wise, but also the feces as well. Microorganisms are any disease that's transmissible or contagious, and so it could include any of the following on this slide bacteria, viruses, fungi, mycoplasmas, protozoa, or parasites. So this, this list could get a little bit in depth, but we're going to hit a few of these in the next few slides. Parasites. They're organisms that live on other organisms or a host without providing any benefit in return. So the two types of parasites that we'll cover today are internal parasites and external parasites. 
internal parasites. They live inside the bird. Sometimes they can be seen with the unaided eye. And they have two main types of life cycles. So you can see here on this slide, this is a really great, great diagram. On the left part of the diagram, you can see the direct life cycle of the internal parasite, which says that the bird eats parasite A, the parasite lives inside the bird, and then the bird excretes the parasite egg. So that's the direct life cycle. The indirect life cycle is on the right-hand side of the diagram, and it, says, it gives an example about an earthworm. So an earthworm eats a parasite egg, the bird then eats the earthworm, which don't forget had eaten the parasite egg already. The parasite then lives in the bird, and then the bird excretes the parasite egg. So if you think about it, at that time, we're excreting eggs that are already problematic with internal parasites, and that means that they're in the environment at that time, and that any of the rest of the flock could come into contact with those eggs at the time. External parasites. These are parasites that live on the skin, the shanks, or the feathers. So they can include fleas, bed bugs, lice, mites, fleas, mosquitoes, or ticks. They primarily cause mechanical damage, and they do cause long-term decline in health. Tissue and feather damage is actually a visible symptom that you can see of an external parasite problem. And nits or bugs can also be visible, and we'll go through some of those next. Scaly leg mites, this is a great picture of them. So the treat, this is what they look like. And then the treatment is actually petroleum jelly or vegetable oil. And you just rub that all over the legs and it acts as a smothering agent and you can reapply that as needed and it should take care of the scaly leg problem. Next is the northern fowl mite. These are really, really tiny mites that are hard to see unless you have a very close up microscopic picture like this one, but sometimes you can see them moving around on the skin if you pull the feathers back and you look very, very quickly. The treatment is permethrin, which can be applied in house, the houses, the coops, the roofs, the floors, or inter interior surfaces, but make sure that you're already, always reading labels because it's very important that you're paying attention to labels as far, especially in layer production, where you're consuming eggs. So you want to make sure that you're paying attention to labels because there's very few things that are labeled for egg production. So here's an example of lice eggs. Again, the same is the treatment with permethrin, which can be applied in the houses, the roosts, the floors, or the interior surfaces. And I really like this picture because it shows a very, a very clear up close picture of what those lice eggs look like. And don't forget to read labels as always. So here's an example of fowl pox. You can see these little popped up raised dark areas on the bird's comb. Um, and so the treatment is actually there's not one, but you can vaccinate. However, there's disagreement on the value of vaccinating after an outbreak. The scientific studies are a little bit all over the place, and so that's why I said that there's just disagreement. So vent trauma or vent pecking, it's a preventative measure that you would put in place to make sure that this doesn't happen in your flock. So allow the birds to have plenty of spacing as well as proper nesting boxes and spacing there, and then also proper lighting and remove problem birds if you can source them out. If you see that one bird is a problem for the rest of the flock, just simply cull that bird or quarantine that bird and see if you can break that behavior, but that's hard to do. Changes in egg production. Infectious diseases generally cause a sudden drop in egg production, so that's something that you really should pay attention to. You can see any of the following on the slide as far as egg production changes. Soft shelled eggs, wrinkled eggs, an inactive reproductive tract, day length, egg bound, peritonitis, a prolapse, or age can be any factor that affects egg production. So here's a really good example of some misshapen or wrinkled eggs that you can see. So if these were the types of eggs that you're getting on a regular basis or just out of the blue, that indicates that there is some sort of problem in your flock. Here are, an, here are a list of reportable diseases in North Carolina. So uh, some of these you'll recognize right off, such as salmonella. There's a couple of different types. 
Then we also have mycoplasma. You may have heard of that one. And of course, I'm sure you've probably heard of avian influenza, which comes in two types as well, a high pathogenic, an HPAI, or a low pathogenic, an LPAI. And then also you've probably heard of exotic Newcastle disease as well as West Nile. So if your flock has tested positive for any of these diseases, it is a reportable disease, meaning that the North Carolina Department of Agriculture must be made aware of it. Avian influenza. So you can always check the current status of the influenza in our state, whether we have it or not. And you can see the website here. It's www.ncagr.gov slash avian flu slash. So here is a chart of some of the warning signs of avian influenza. A lack of energy or appetite. Decreased egg production or safe or soft or misshapen eggs swelling of the head, the eyelids, and the comb, purple discoloration of the wattles, the combs, and the legs, stumbling, falling down, or diarrhea, and then, of course, sudden death. So, like I said, I always encourage folks to check the website to see what the status is at this time in North Carolina of avian influenza. And don't forget that your biosecurity practices are what help to make sure we don't bring diseases like avian influenza into our state and into your flock. So if you do have a disease problem or you would like to find out a clinical diagnosis for a flock problem that you have, you do have a lab right here in Raleigh, North Carolina. There are other labs available as well. The one in Raleigh is called the Rollins Animal Disease Diagnostic Laboratory and is available to do these diagnostic lab services if you're unsure of the cause or if you do have multiple birds that are sick. So a fresh mortality or bird uh, or, or an actual live bird can be used for the necropsy. And then here is the website and the phone number for that. So there is a cost involved in that, but it's very minimal and it would help you find out what the clinical diagnosis of your flock is. And that way you're able to move forward for prevention in the future and hopefully have a possible treatment of your flock too. Biosecurity. Always wash your hands after working with poultry. It's very important. Shower and change clothes before mingling with other poultry owners and before returning to your own flock. So make sure you're not going down to the local feed and seed store in the same boots that you just wore from working with your birds, especially if you suspect or know that you have sick birds. The same thing goes with if you have a neighbor that you know or suspect has sick birds, to not go over to their property and then come back to your property without changing clothes and properly installing biosecurity practices at that time. Another example is to use boot covers and coveralls or a dedicated set of clothes and shoes. Like you can see in this picture, these folks have their boots outside and they're able to use just this specific dedicated pair of boots for working with their flock.